Okay, so session six, Dead Among the Depths. And when we last left our motley collection of kindred, they had entered the sort of border between the Castello and the Canareggio districts of Venice. This was after they had come across a member of another coterie known as the Tourists, who were mostly sort of foreign kindred who have travelled to Venice for various different reasons. And they came across a young member of the Brugeois clan called Valerie Reyes. And she was quite sort of badly beaten up and burned. She told them a tale of how, as the tourists were wont to do, and indeed they've been joined by some of our kindred heroes on previous occasions. They'd gone out partying, sampling a little bit of blood off people, nothing too serious. However, it seems people or parties unknown had somehow drugged the blood or the vessels that they were feeding on. And then when they'd gone to book a water taxi, one of the standard methods of travel throughout the canals of Venice, they had been set upon by these unknown people who, thanks to the sort of slowing down effects of the drugs that were running through the tourists' systems, these people were able to basically beat them into a pulp, pretty much. Uh, Valerie Reyes was sort of fell over the side of the water taxi into the water, and that's the only reason she escaped during the fracas. Eventually, enough of the drug effects had worn off and she'd recovered enough of her strength to pull herself out of the canal, at which point she made her way towards the communal haven of our collected group of kindred of the, the coterie in question to see if she could get their help. After discovering this, they originally attempted to call the leader of the tourist coterie, when well, I say call, text, to say they'd um, found Valerie. They got a, a very curt message saying, I'll just bring her back to our haven. At which point Valerie revealed that apparently the leader of her coterie had been taken by these unknown assailants and they realised it must be a trap. But eventually they made their way there, they did a little bit of scouting around and they found a, a human clad all in black fatigues wielding a, a gun, rifling through the building. They also spotted that there were some people in a building opposite and to certain eyes only what appeared to be an almost sort of golden stream of almost sunlight blazing out through the cracks of a door on an apartment opposite. They were deciding what to do. They interrogated, using the powers of their blood, this assailant, this man with a gun, and found out he worked for someone called Father Angelo, and he referred to demons that they had captured, obviously meaning kindred. They went into the alleyway round the back of the property and they were debating what to do when they heard the loud, imperious voice from the street they had previously been in of presumably this priest referring to them as demons and calling them to come out and face the judgment of the Lord. And that is pretty much where we're going to pick up this time, guys. So what I've done is I have drawn a very simple map here, which hopefully you can all now see. I see you guys are on there. The building outlined in yellow is the tourist's haven. I've also outlined the sort of street layout outside in blue, just to make it a little bit clearer. So you obviously got the main street sort of coming down here. There's a little alleyway down the side here, and this is round the back of the property where you guys are now sort of located. Obviously there's actually the main street sort of down here, and there's various canal boats and such like down there. You can hear the, the voice of the priest coming from where this uh, red figure is located now this isn't a, a tactical combat map by any means it's just to establish relative positioning and as we were saying just before we started it may not even be necessary depending on what you guys do but i just wanted to give you a, a sort of rough idea of how things are sort of set at the minute or if any of you've got any questions at any point or if there's any confusion about what things are where they are obviously just shout up so 
we're going to pick up the this priest has shouted come out demons and face the judgment of the lord and we literally pick up straight after we left off with the the echoing imperious tones of father angelo sort of fading into the the night of venice challenging these these devils these demons to come out and face the lord's wrath currently you are all in the the back street behind the tourist haven so having gone out the back door oh straight straight away over to you guys what do you do how tall are these buildings they're pretty tall because as we said with the uh, space being at a premium in venice they tend to build upwards rather than outwards mm -hmm. so most buildings are pretty tall and some of them especially some of the older ones you know the more sort of like wooden or sort of slightly older stone buildings seem to have a bit of a lean to them which is no doubt exaggerated by subsidence and things like that in venice so the the city as a whole sort of gives the impression of that this rickety ensemble of new and old buildings all sort of like leaning on each other most most buildings are sort of three four five stories tall well at best they've seen two people go into the building or around the back of the building i doubt they'd be aware of either hugo or franco well, I'm going to assume it's me and Aurelio thereafter. So Aurelio needs to hang back, as does Hugo and Franco. And uh, I'll go and stick my head around the corner to see what's going on. Okay. I'm going to be as quiet as possible. Okay, so you should see yourself on the map there. Feel free to move yourself yep. to where you want to go. I'm happy you've had to move your token. Uh, what do I need for a stealth roll? Okay, I would say you're probably looking at either dex or wits for your attribute. I'll leave that up to you. And stealth. Success is four. Okay, yeah. So, obviously, I won't tell you whether you succeed or not, but um, feel free to move yourself to where you want to go. Yeah, so... I'm assuming that's the building here. Yeah, that's right. The the one outlined in yellow is the the tourist haven. And the, the, the blue outlined area guessing... is basically the streets. I'm guessing the front door's about there. Yep. So I'll, I'll use the framework as my cover whilst I'm sticking my head around to figure out what I'm dealing with here. Okay, no problem. So you you sort of peer out through a crack in the front door and you see on the street, so on the building opposite, obviously having just come out of it, you can see two more of these these men again carrying like these shotguns wearing these black fatigues balaclavas etc goggles they they look to be similar to these sort of like night vision goggles that the guy inside was wearing or so, so i should say infravision goggles you know like heat goggles exactly yeah standing between them is a is a man so pale he, he could almost be a kindred himself Although he's clearly breathing, he's. I mean, that might be due to the the moonlight. Obviously, the moon is. The moon will be full in but uh, three or four days. The moonlight streaming down him. A tall, thin, pallid man wearing the the black and white vestments of a member of the church. He's. He appears to be holding what looks to be a large duffel bag at his side he's standing there he's wearing like a wide brimmed black hat he's looking around the streets 
you can see he's, he's just taking a he's just taking an outpouring of breath which hisses out in steam in the cold at night air in this January chill obviously just having finished calling out his challenge okay I'll step back and go to the back move Aurelio further towards Hugo and I'll just hold up um, free on my hand. Yeah, because you see Sun, you go like that. Um, Sean, this guy we captured, did he have a shotgun as well? He did, yep. Okay, and he's still with us, is he? He's yeah, unconscious, he's, he's, but with he's, us. he's unconscious, but he's with you. Yeah. Any of his okay. equipment you wanted, you can have taken. But he's, okay, basically, okay. Got, he's I... basically got the heat goggles and the shotgun. Yeah, I'll have taken both of them. Absolutely fine. Um, should we run or do we want to have dinner? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm looking to uh, the more physical, aggressive sorts of the group because this is not my thing. My thing is uh, staying hidden and. Keeping out of the way of these, these sorts. Yeah. We haven't got long to talk about this. Personally, I'm happy to kill them all, but we don't know exactly what they're armed with. As you're debating this, the the, the stillness of the, the Venice night is pierced by a, a blood-curdling screaming that appears to be coming from the the street that you know the priest is currently on. I'm not really too fussed about a blood curdling screen, to be honest. Um, I reckon Aurelio and Franco go head towards the canal, just start pulling back, and myself and Hugo will be your support, basically. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to uh, start making a way if, if we're going to try and withdraw. That's not a problem. But that's if everybody doesn't want to fight. Yeah, I mean, I'll go along with it. It's just I'm not very good at it. So, you know, if people want to do it, then... Um... Again, Judging by a, the state of that woman, it, it's going to be painful. There's another blood curdling scream from the street, and by now the a faint smell, almost like burnt pork or meat, has started to like waft down the little alleyway to your undead nostrils. Um, can I walk down this little alleyway, kind of silently, and see what's going on? Yeah, make either a wits or a deck stealth roll if you're trying to remain unseen. Uh, uh, okay, so wits and stealth. Yeah, absolutely uh, two fine. successes. Hugging the shadows, you start edging down this alleyway. Eventually, you see where are you so you're there so yes i'm here also oh, i'm moving the wrong carriage this is wrong sorry this is where i want to be okay no problems so as you peer around the alleyway you see the the two men in black fatigues with the priest standing behind them and the two let, let's call them soldiers just so we've got a convenient label for them the two soldiers are holding a person who's on their knees between them, you recognise Raiden Scott, the leader of the Anarch Coterie known as the Taurus, a thin, lanky American Brugeois. He also looks incredibly badly burned. His clothing is torn. He's covered in cuts. 
like I say, there's the two of them sort of like hands on his shoulder, holding him on the knees. And as you watch, one of them lifts up what looks to be like a metal thermos flask or something similar. And he pours out what appears to be a clear liquid onto the face of Raiden Scott. As this liquid touches his undead flesh, the flesh appears to like bubble, smoke and almost sort of like melt and fall off his face. At which point he again lets out another of these ear piercing screams, or well, they're now becoming sort of slightly gurgled as like a lot of his face has been eaten away. Okay. Um So I will just head back and whisper that they're torturing the kindred. Okay, um, just as you start making your way back to say this, as you're sort of retreating back into the shadows, you you see one of the, the soldiers look round at the priest and he says, uh, what shall we do now, Father? At which point the, the priest says, well, if they won't come out, we have no further use of them. And he reaches down into the, the duffel bag and he takes what looks to be a small sword out of the duffel bag. And then obviously you duck back okay. to tell the other guys that they're torturing this kid. Um, okay, so I guess when he pulls out the sword... Um, how close are all of us with this coterie? Are we close? Well, they're, they're technically your tenants because they sort of like reside in your sort of area but it, and you, you've been at a couple of you have been out with like hunting and sort of drinking with them I mean you're not exactly bosom buddies or anything okay so I think when I see him pull the sword I'm going to shoot him with a shotgun okay go for it make your uh, dex roll for that uh, dex so fire that arms dex fire arms Uh, that is three successes. Okay. So yeah, your shot rings out in the night and hits this priest square in his shoulder, sort of throwing him back several feet. At which point there is a the the two soldiers like push this person down to the ground and they like return fire with their own guns but because they've got to lift them up you've got more than enough time to like duck back into it and instead of hitting you you just see like on the corner of the building like some of the stonework get chewed up and like spray out in stone fragments obviously the rest of you hear, hear this screaming then you hear the like <laughs> from you go there's a slight cry from the priest as he gets hit in the shoulder and then there's this barrage of return fire and the the small sort of alleyway that you are sort of ducking back into, you go, is filled with like dust from this debris and sort of masonry that's been chewed up by the return fire, making it quite difficult to see, like down the alleyway because it's full of all this dust and sort of smoke. Is this area here, John, an alleyway, or is that no? It's a, it's another building. Solid this building, here. yeah. Yeah, the only sort of streets where you are are the ones sort of outlined in blue. Yeah. And then obviously, like, once you get to here, it's you can see that it's the street all up and down here mm -hmm. on the canal. Okay. So, I'm going to go in a sort of semi-initiative order now, just because obviously we're actually getting into... You've, you've effectively really initiated a combat, so... I've wrote down the the current sort of order, so we're going to go with Franco first. So Franco, what are you doing? Um, how easy would it be to climb up onto the roof of the group? You know, the highlighted building. Well, I tell you what, we've not established how many stories there are in it, so I'm going to say, can you roll me a D4? Then we'll add two, and that's the number of stories in it. Okay, so it's a five-story building. So I'm just going to put a, 
a number five on there somewhere. Okay, so effectively it'll take you five turns to like if you wanted to climb up to the very top. Hmm. Yeah, it's quite a while. That and uh, that's that sort of moving at like a normal speed, not having to make a roll, going safely, checking your footing, etc. You could potentially do it quicker, but that would involve a roll and potentially like falling if you failed on the roll. What about this building sort of next to it? Just okay. Just Again, it. make us the same roll. Okay, so only three stories on that building. Okay. And would I be able to jump down from the roof if I needed to? I don't know what sort of Yeah, you'd be able to jump down. I mean you might take a bit you might take a bit of damage, but it would only be it'd be the same as if you get shot, you know, you get to halve the damage because just like falling onto something isn't really such a stress for like vampires. You don't have sort of internal organs and stuff like that you really have to worry about so you, you might yeah. take a bit of damage i mean especially if you like jump from the top of the fifth floor like down to the ground but oh yeah that, that's why i was it, it'd be a case of like you might sort of have a bit of a limp for a few minutes when you get up it's not like you're going to fall off it and then just be like oh that's me done yeah uh it's just the time it's going to take um how far is it Roughly, how many sort of squares could we move? Do you think? I'd say I'd say you could probably like do maybe like three in a turn. In a turn, yeah. okay. I mean, I say we'll keep we'll keep it fairly loose, so we're not getting down to exact measurements. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to go around the other way. I'm going to go this way. Okay. Try and uh, confuse them once I come round the corner. Okay, so I'm going to stop you there. As on this boat here, the, the tarpaulin that's on top of it is suddenly thrown aside and you see another one of these black fatigued soldiers rise sort of like he's crouched down but you see he's like lifted up a gun that he's stabilizing on the boat he fires the gun at you down the narrow alleyway however because he's got to throw this tarpaulin off and you you're quite quick on your feet you get a bit of advanced notice and you sort of put yourself flat against the wall and the the shotgun pallets sort of hit the the opposing wall on the alleyway and you don't take any damage from it Okay. It's just the one guy, was it? That you can see at the moment, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And he just appears to be sat in... Well, I've been, like, hunkered down in this boat. It may indeed be the boat that these guys used to get here. And perhaps they've just, like, left someone on guard. Yeah. Cool. You can see he's got, like, the same sort of heat vision goggles down over his face, like black balaclava. Okay. So, Aurelio... Uh, what's Sonia doing at the moment? Sonia is currently stood behind this building, especially as there's gunfire going off everywhere. <laughs> I don't know, I guess Aurelia is just gonna very loudly whispers, What should we do? I think we have to fight our way out either way. They're making a terrible racket, so someone will have heard the screams anyway. Yeah, the police won't be far behind. Uh, you need to get out of here, I think. So you can either stay hunkered down in this alley or try and fight, but you're probably better off staying hunkered down in the alley. Um. Hmm. I, I suppose I'll um. I'll be here, sort of, around the corner. 
Okay. Uh, sort of waiting to see if anything comes to this particular street. And there's not a lot for Aurelio to do. Yeah, no, we're, we're going to uh, see how things develop. I think um, Aurelio is not really a soldier. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Uh, he, he's going to hang back for now. Okay, no problem. So you go. You're sort of in this dust-filled alleyway when at the end of the alleyway you see a, a sort of silhouette through the dust and as you watch you suddenly see what appears to be a shining white light roughly in the shape of a sword blade as the priest holding this sort of small sword that he's carrying which seems to be emitting this white light that is a little bit painful for you to look at but doesn't cause you actual damage literally charges through the dust towards you swinging this sword and I am just going to make a roll for him once I bring it, get his stats, which I have bookmarked. Okay. Okay, so at the moment he is going to hit you with the sword. However, you do have a, an opportunity to either use a weapon to defend yourself in which case whoever gets the highest roll most successes does the damage or you can use your you can always use your dex to dodge to try and avoid it but if you do it that way you wouldn't inflict any damage if you manage to dodge that's literally just you trying to get out of the way so if i'm can i use my shotgun to try and knock the blade away and pull the trigger at the same time you wouldn't be able to pull the trigger at the same time, but you could effectively, you could like try to hit him with the butt of it, effectively. Okay. But obviously you wouldn't do as much okay. damage as if you were like... <clears throat> Excellent. Okay, and is that just a standard dex melee? Yep. Locked, okay. Uh, that is three successes. Okay. So you are stabbed or cut sort of quite shallowly by this glowing sword and you have taken three levels of aggravated damage as this sword even though it only shallowly slices your flesh the wound seems to burn as though like fire itself was inflicting this wound on you okay and you can see like around in a similar way to what was happening to the lead, to Raiden Scott you see like wisps of sort of like smoke as the the charred sort of flash around the the cuts hisses and steams in the cold air okay and just so I understand the aggravated damage is the double damage or full damage it's a uh, it's full damage yeah okay yeah yeah so that's three x's in the yeah, yeah. health yeah, okay yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so okay. next person to go is Sonia. Or Ron. Obviously, as well, you go, how do you, re how do you react to being hit like this? Do you, do you let out a cry? Do you shout or anything like that? Because obviously like, Sonia might hear that or the others might hear that. Um, you, you are like a hardened sort of like military type, so even though you feel the pain, yeah, no, you don't I don't think I do. I just, I think I just, I guess call out watch out for the sword um you know kind of a bit of a shout yep so um, you guys hear like the sound of like metal clashing on metal as he sort of like knocks your your shotgun aside you've still got a hold of it but he like knocks out of the way and strikes you then you hear like a, a slightly ragged voice of you go shouting to watch out for the sword and any of you who are sort of like near the out really near the alleyway which is probably only a radio at this point you can actually see through the dust and debris that's filling that little alleyway. You can see like a sort of faint hint of this white light shining out from the alleyway. I'm going to go to there. And then I'm going to use potence 2 to pounce on the priest. Absolutely fine. Make an attack roll. If, you, if you're doing an attack, which I presume you are. 
Yes, it'd be cool. I dive in to talk. <laughs> Stop that. <this. laughs> Okay, he's going to try and dodge. And to dodge he does. As you're sort of like reeling back a little bit from the blow, the dust is suddenly sort of like blown aside by the, the passage of Sonya. She literally like leaps over you. You go to try and pounce on this priest. At the last moment, the, the priest sort of throws himself backwards out of the alleyway, just narrowly missing where, like, Sonya's foot, like, crashes down onto the cobbles of the street, and you again see a few chips of stone come up from the sheer force of her landing. Okay, you go. Um. I think I will just pull the trigger on the shotgun again. Yep, absolutely. Go for it. Um, choose me, Dex. Ooh, that is no successes. Okay, you squeeze the trigger on the shotgun. Unfortunately, given all the the new fresh dust that's been thrown up by Sonya landing, it's difficult to like precisely pick your target and you're trying to avoid Sonya as well, so you don't manage to tag the priest, unfortunately. Okay, then finally it is the the two soldiers, again, we'll call them here, so I'm going to have one shoot at Jugo and one shoot at Sonya. So, the one shooting at Jugo... Okay, that is three successes. So you can make a, a dex dodge roll to dodge if you want. Okay. Obviously, each success you get like cancels out one of theirs. If you get three is or Is that more. just a dex one, is it? Or is there a dodge um, skill? It will be... It's dex athletics, I believe. Okay. Uh, five successes. Yeah, not a problem. They, you see them from a mile off, lifting these guns, and you've been in, you've been in firefights and situations like that before. You you jink from left to right in the alleyway, and the shot goes nowhere near you. Okay, so the one firing at the Sonya. That is two successes. So you can use a Dex Athletics to dodge if you wish as well, Sonia. I'll just use Fortitude 2. Okay, what does your Fortitude 2 do? Uh, toughness. All vampires have this power except an innate ability to ignore damage that would otherwise inconvenience and even disable other kindred. Uh, subtract the Fortitude of the Defender from all superficial damage sustained and then halve it. Yeah. <laughs> you... The... The shot like hits you full bore in your chest and it like shreds your clothing, but you're just like, I'm what? They're not firing sort of at any special rounds, it's just like shotgun pellets. It hits you, like I say, your clothing gets sort of shredded, the wind's whipped around you, but you yourself, powered by your supernatural fortitude, do you have to make a rouse roll for that or is it? I do have to make a rouse Okay, that, so yeah. make your rouse roll. Yep, so it'll have raised your hunger by one. What's your hunger level at the moment? Just out interest. Two. Two? That's fine. Yep, so powered by your blood and your supernatural fortitude, the, the shotgun blast does no damage to you at all, even though it hits you like dead on. Okay, so that's them done. We're back round to the start, so it's Franco again. Um, This guy on the boat... Yep. What? Do I think this is sort of body armor they're wearing, or you know, like heavy stuff? If they went in the water, it would cause them problems. Or 
They, they don't seem to be. They just seem to be wearing like combat fatigues. Effectively, it, it might give them a little bit of armor because of padding and whatever, but they're not wearing like full on like tactical body armor or anything like that. Nah, so it probably wouldn't be that bad. Uh, try and deal with this guy before heading back. Uh, so can I move and attack him? Yep, move yourself next to him on the boat. You can literally like leap onto the boat and like. Are you going in with just like your fists, or do you have a weapon you're using? Uh, I haven't got a weapon, so this isn't okay. going to be particularly bad. So it's either going to be strength or dex athletics, whichever you prefer. Okay. Depending on whether you like, or whether you're just like. <laughs> yeah, I mean they're both the same, but uh, I think it would be more dexterity. He's going to try and jump on them. Nice. And what? And obviously, you made your roll, but what is your aim? What are you aiming to do? Are you just trying to inflict damage, or? Um, well, I was trying to get the gun off of him, ideally. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm what I'm weapon. what I'm going to do with this is he's going to defend using his gun. Again, he can't fire it at you because you're right next to him. But he's going to try and like hit you with the gun. So if he wins, he'll he might inflict a little bit of damage on you from like. T if you if you win, you take no damage. You wrestle the gun off him, and you can inflict a little bit of damage on him if you want. Right, yeah. So let me make a roll for him. Okay, and that is three successes. So that would be minus two. So that'll be one. So you will take one point of superficial damage, as literally like catches you on the chin with the butt of his gun, but okay. really doesn't do a great deal to you. Now, just to point out to you guys, in case any of you are unaware, if you wish, you can use your blood to boost your attributes. And the way that works is you effectively have to make a rouse roll in order to do it, which obviously can mean your hunger goes up effectively. But you can then add a... You get to add your blood surge value to the dice pool of any test which uses an attribute. So for your guys, it'll be based on your generation, so your blood potency, which I presume is, is it one for all of you. Yeah, it should be. Yeah, so yeah. if you do a blood surge, so you make that uh, that roused roll, you get to add like two to your attributes effectively because you're just sort of like powering yourself up by calling on the strength of the blood in you. But obviously it can result in your hunger going up. Okay, so that's Franco. So we're on to Aurelio. Um... <clears throat> Any windows or doors on this side of the street into the building marked in green or yellow, I guess? Yeah, there's a there's the back door that you guys came out of, which leads into this mm -hmm. street. So you can easily, and that's that's pre-picked and open, so you can easily go in through that. I mean, you've seen Sonya yep. do it. Yep, in we go. Um, what sort of rooms are we looking at? I say on the low level, as is customary. There's effectively like a small kitchenette, and then mm -hmm. you know from what the others have told you from when they're inside, there's like a there's a bedroom, sort of like about the third floor. There's like a lounge on the second floor because there's mostly only like one room per floor because they build up, mm -hmm. and then there's another couple of rooms that they didn't really get to higher up. Mm. Um, gonna go into the kitchen. And okay, yeah. um, I'll very rapid inventory of what's available. <laughs> as far as what I'm looking for is uh, flammables, oil, you know, very distilled alcohol, any kind of, uh, I suppose, yeah, if, if it's, uh, if there's like, I don't know, it probably wouldn't be like gas canisters, but yeah. Okay, there's a, there's not a great, you have a, only have a quick look around, obviously, but there's not a great deal of flammable stuff, which doesn't really surprise you because like Kindred have been using it as as mm -hmm. the haven. Um, you can see there's effectively like a gas cooker in here. 
there's probably a, a small fire extinguisher there. I'm going to say roll me a roll me a d6 if you get an even number. There's maybe like a, a kerosene lamp. Yeah, mm -hmm. so there's like a small sort of kerosene lamp. You know, the sort of old minery style like antique yeah. ones, which are actually quite common in Venice. They often hang them on the the bows of like the boats, particularly in misty weather. So a lot of people have them as just sort of like things around here, especially when the um, when they have what's called high water, when like the water levels rise, and like the electricity supply can be a little bit on the dodgy side. So a lot of homes do have these. All right, so I'll uh, I'll grab the lamp. Yep. Uh, presuming that it, it, there's like I don't know matches to ignite it. Yeah, there's like a box of those like long matches yep. next to it. Yep. So I'll I'll get those. Um, no booze, I presume. No. In the, same in the kitchen. Okay. So the lamp matches. Um, up we go. I mean, this is a couple of things, but all he's doing is he's running through the. Um, yeah, get a tree running through, grabbing it, and heading upstairs. Up to the top and uh, bedroom uh, in the third floor. Okay, so it's going to take it's going to take you till next round to get to the so you going up a floor and grabbing yeah. this. So on the next yeah. turn, you will be in the bedroom on the third floor, effectively. Yeah, yeah. No, I just wanted to confirm that that's that's actually where I'm going. Yes, it so. is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so after Aurelio, it's uh, Father Angelo. So I'm going to roll a d6, because obviously Hugo and Sonia are both sort of pretty near him. I'm going to roll a d6, and if I get one, two, or three, he's going for Hugo, otherwise he's going for Sonia. Okay, so he's going for Sonia. So let me just check his melee, there we go. Okay, so currently he is on three successes. Obviously, you can choose to use a weapon to defend yourself, Sonia, or you can choose to use like Dex Athletics or something similar to just try and dodge. I will dodge. Okay. Okay, so he's only got one success through. So that turns it into three levels of aggravated damage as you are stabbed with this glowing sword. And again, the wound appears to blister. And unlike the shotgun shell, which hit yourself and like you were just like, yeah, and what caused no pain? This causes severe pain that seems to ripple throughout your body. Okay, so I lose one health because of the two additional fortitude. Does it say only superficial damage for, for the fortitude? No, I add my fortitude to my health anyway. All oh, right, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, that's fine then. So I'm just trying to sort this out now. It's all right, no problems. Well, there you go. One health. Okay, and you might get your chance for some sweet, sweet revenge now because it's your go. That's a good thing. <clears throat> I'm going to use my potent. Mm -hmm. Lethal body, all damage is aggravated, and I ignore <laughs> do it. <laughs> one level armor per potency level, so I've got potency two. Yep. So I ignore two levels of armor. Yep, he's only got one. Yep. I'm also going to boost my um, strength with my blood. Yep, so you get an additional plus two to your attribute. Yep. Obviously make your, um, your rouse wrong. Yeah, we'll do that. As you call on the power of the stolen blood. Yeah, one success. Nice, so your hunger doesn't rise. And then make your attack roll. Oh, and obviously he's going to try and dodge. I don't really fancy his chances, but... Okay. There you go. So... Oh, I don't know if he, if he succeeds on all of these. He might just be alright. which he spectacularly doesn't. So I got one success. That's knocked off one of yours. So it's three plus whatever your... Let's see, so that'd be... 
Let me just check for, for brawling, how much damage gets added, because it's normally the weapon. Boom, boom, boom. I think it might just be the, you know, whatever you roll. Um, yeah, weapons, there we go, improvised state. Yeah, it is, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so it's... And that's all that. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's three levels of aggravated damage, which, having already taken three levels of lethal and yep. being immortal is pretty much enough to put him to like almost dead so would you like to describe how you and you you've, you can effectively have killed him if you wish because so like I say he's so so nearly dead or you can have him like just sort of lingering at death's doorway that's entirely down to you but would you like to narrate how this unfolds as you call on the power of your blood to strike down this man of god summoning the power of my blood i punch out towards his chest Yep. Turning my hand into effectively a stake nice. and grabbing his heart. So I literally, at the moment, hold his heart in my hand. And I'll, I'll let him realize that. <laughs> okay. And that is what. Plus happens. one dead. Okay. <laughs> He's double dead. <laughs> he was dead before, but I have ripped his heart out. That's plus one dead in my book. So yeah, so you you literally did the whole like Kalimar thing out of a uh, Indiana Jones, where you like punch forward, sort of closing your fist as it goes into his chest, and you wrench it back out. It all happens so rapidly that he sort of like he takes a step forward as though he's going to carry on like pressing his attacks against you. Then he looks down and there's just like this gaping, bloody sort of dripping hole in his chest. He, he sort of looks up and his mouth opens as though he's trying to say something and then like the strength goes out of his legs and he just falls face first onto the ground and i will say as he dies where's your god now nice and he is as we like to say in the trade double dad okay so i'm just gonna make a quick quick roll for his guys Okay, so they actually seem sort of spurred on and more determined by the fact that they've seen their sort of leader, this holy figure, struck down his, his very heart pulled out by one of these demons, and you're still sort of stood there, son, with this in your hand. It's only just sort of like stopping to beat. That's how quickly you've you've wrenched it out of his chest. And obviously the two soldiers are sort of like shouting and like howling as they're sort of readying their guns to like carry on going but before they get to do that it's you go okay so um i would like to activate my eyes of the beast which uh makes me super scary um and i would like then to uh do the blood surge okay or strength well, i'm gonna tell you as well as a little added like bonus because they literally just passed the, like the morale check that i was doing for them and you obviously give extra bonuses to intimidation so i'm gonna say sort of seeing you coming out after the scene the heart ripped out by this like tiny petite woman then of some this very not petite like military guy with like glowing red demonic eyes comes like striding out of the dust they're they're not sort of straightforward, like, oh, just like throwing the weapons down and running. But you you see the look in their eyes, and you've seen that look in soldiers' eyes before. You know that, like, as soon as they get a chance, they're getting the hell out of here. Like, the fight's just mm -hmm. drained out of them, their faces. <clears throat> okay. But you get used to getting um, there first. So, uh... So, given that I see that the fight is gone from them... Uh, what I want to do is try and jump on the first one yep. and uh, start eating his blood, if I can. Okay, that is not a problem. So effectively, you're you're making a, a feeding attack, which is absolutely fine. So you need to do a bite attack. It counts to, to like get your fangs in. It counts as an unarmed attack, but you get a minus two penalty to it. But you do do aggravated damage. And then you get to start feeding. Okay, so... Once you've got your fangs I, in, they're going to be like... 
<laughs> so can I uh, uh, do the blood surge? Yeah, make a that, make so, a rouse roll. Okay, so then make a rouse roll. Okay, so uh, it'll, right, it'll right. move your hunger up by one. So okay. what is your hunger on at the moment? Two. Okay, fine. Yeah, um, so make your attack roll with a minus two modifier. So, okay, so I'll do a strength plus melee. Yep. And then it's basically... Well, when it, 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 would, it would be athletics because you're not using a weapon. You're literally just trying to pounce on them. Okay, sorry. So, okay, so strength plus athletics and then plus two for the blood, minus two for defeating attack. Yeah, so effectively you're making a normal roll, yeah. Okay, so, okay, that is one success. One success, okay. I'm going to make his dex dodge roll. It's, I know it's not dodge, but you know what I mean. Dex athletics. Because effectively he's trying to run away anyway. Okay, he manages to avoid you. As they're sort of, and it's going on to their go next. So basically they are... They're sort of withdrawing, and it's in a sort of... Or they're obviously trained, like, military people, but they are, like, doing, like, a strategic withdrawal rather than out-and-out -out route. You know, they sort of, like, keep like, looking backwards and trying to, like, cover themselves. But And they've taken a few pot shots, but I'm not going to roll for them because they're literally just, like, <coughs> as they're withdrawing. They're not taking time to aim or anything like that. They seem to be making their way back towards the main street and the canal. Okay, so the, the one in the boat there... Obviously, he can't really shoot you now, uh, Franco, because you're both sort of like wrestling. So it's just going to be a straightforward like strength athletics for him. He's trying to push you off the boat. You can defend with strength athletics if you wish. Okay. Uh, yep. And what would you, if you win, what's your aim? Um, I, I assume we're still wrestling over the gun. Yeah, basically he's got the gun and he's trying to use it like almost like a bar to like push you over the side of the boat. Yeah, I'll basically just do exactly the same thing, but hopefully holding on the gun at, as he falls into the water if, okay. if I was successful. Have you got potents? No. Potents? Not what, as a... As a discipline. Discipline. No. Okay, so I'm currently on two successes. So if you make your roll, Darren. Uh, exactly the same. Okay, so it's two. So I'm basically going to say that you guys are still sort of like pushing. He's trying to push you off, but you're resisting and neither of you has managed to gain the upper hand as you're sort of struggling back and forwards in this boat. The boat has started to like rock a bit as you're both sort of struggling about. Obviously the, the top all in's are long gone now. Okay, and then we come back to, to to you, Franco. Anyway, so. Oh, okay. Um, I don't really know what's going on behind me yet, so. Um... You, I think you can you can probably hear there's like shouts. There's been gunshots. Then yeah. you can hear like the sound of like running feet on stone. Maybe getting a little bit closer, but like you say, you've been tussling with this guy, so you haven't really had a chance to look around and see what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I I don't. I mean, obviously, I know this stuff going on, but I don't know who's yeah. sort of winning or what's going on in that sense. Um, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna try this one more time, but I'm gonna like um, use use my blood to okay. give myself a better chance, basically. So, so make your rouse roll. Um, okay, so you're fine. Your hunger doesn't increase, but you get a bonus of plus two. So make your strength athletics roll or dex if you prefer. I assume you just put a two in the Yeah, exactly, fire. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oof. Right, okay. He's trying to do exactly the same, trying to like push you off the boat as you're trying to like get him. Yep. So let me make his roll. Okay, so he has only got two successes. So you have comprehensively beaten him. What is your aim? Uh, yeah, keep hold of the gun and push yeah. him off the boat. Yep, so you literally rag the gun out of his hand with one of yours and then just plant your, sort of planting your foot on the, the rim of the boat. You push his chest. He topples over and disappears into the water. With a 
a loud splash. Okay, Aurelia. You've made it up to the third floor. You're in this small sort of bedroom room. You can see there's basically a couple of single-sized beds in here. They don't really look like they've been slept in much. Not surprising, Kindred Haven. But uh, sheets. The, the, yeah, there's, there's sheets on the bed. Like I say, it looks like they were made some time ago and they've they've not really been used. So they're all on the beds like duvets. There's a, there's a couple of small wooden dressers, maybe like a pot plant, a few like clothes. That sort of stuff. Um, any closets or similar? There's no clo There's no sort of closets you can see. Obviously, there are stairs going up though to these other two floors, and there's like a couple of small windows. So stairs going up still from yeah. where? Yeah, you're on the third floor now. Yeah, yeah. there's like yeah, two more floor, floors. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna rough up one of the. Uh, uh, the beds uh, okay. in the process of grabbing the sheet. Yep, not a problem. You grab a, a sort of thick sheet. Yep, and up we go to inspect the other two floors. Okay, not a problem. You continue to head up to the fourth floor. Okay, so now it will be the priest, but he's double dead, so it's straight onto Sonia. What do you do, Sonia? Right there. I shall attack the one directly below me. Okay, go for it. <clears throat> As you charge down the street towards these these fleeing two soldiers. And I presume you're still hitting them with like the ag damage, etc. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's see if his dex dodge can do anything. No, it can't. So, would you like to describe how you like effectively explosively detonate this person, <laughs> since, since they are, they are they're probably triple dead at least? I'm just going to snap his spine uh, with one punch, sending him flying down the street. To be honest, I think that's probably the, the least, nicest way you can go without me again reaching into the back of his chest and ripping out another heart. Yep, and that is indeed what happens. You sort of smack him in the spine. There's an ear-splitting crack, and he pretty much flies into one of the walls and sort of lands in a bloody heap. Okay, you go. Um, I guess I would like to do something similar to the last guy. Yep, move yourself down. Um, uh, is my, how long does the blood stay roused for? The scene. Okay, cool. So uh, I will do an unarmed attack, which is strength plus athletics plus two. Uh, which is four. And are you striking with a weapon or are you block punching? Uh, punching. Okay. So I've got one success, so you would do three for superficial damage to him. So yeah, so you punch the soldier and he sort of staggers forward. He's still running, but you can see like he's he's quite winded by your heavy blow. He sort of like you know sort of half falls over but manages to struggle to his feet as he keeps running. Okay. Then we go on to the the soldiers. This guy's basically going to make it to the street there. He sort of... He, he, he's obviously looking more behind him, so not paying attention. Doesn't realise that his like, guy's been dumped out of the boat and it's now Franco who's, who's in there. So he's just like sort of, sort of looking over his shoulder and sort of like holding his holding his chest and sort of struggling for breath, he starts like running towards the boat, obviously playing on like jumping in the boat and getting the hell out of dodge. And then we come back to Franco. I remember, is this gun loaded that I've got? Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, it is. Um, yeah, so as I see this guy come running around... Then I think I'm just going to fire this gun at him. Okay, make uh, your uh, your dex firearms roll. 
Did, and did you say that the blood I used yep. continues for the whole scene? Yeah. Yep. Oh. It's pretty. It's a pretty tasty ability. Yeah. There we go. Oh, that was rubbish, though. Okay. However, he's not dodging because he doesn't know you're there. And you get your weapon damage added to it, which is three. So that is four lethal damage to him, which, given that he's already taken, like, three damage, will be enough to finish him off. So basically he starts running down the street and he's like, Vincetti, Vincetti, we've got to get out of... And then he sort of goes... As he sees you lifting the gun, he sort of tries to skid to a halt and, like, turn round. Time seems to slow down for a few moments. There's a loud... A flash and the, the recoil of the gun. It hits him square in the chest, spinning him around. He almost seems to pirouette around for a few moments and then collapses to the floor. There's some dark stain spreading out on the cobbles below him. And he is. I should okay. just reload in case any others are going to come running around. Yeah, not a problem. You you have a quick look around. And you can see there's like some shells on the the seat of the boat. Obviously, the guy had like got his ammunition there in case he needed to yeah. to like reload. So you like thumb a couple more shells into it. A few more minutes pass, and nothing further seems to have happened. Uh, I'm going to start. Removing bodies, John. <laughs> Absolutely. Fine. I'm going to try and save the vampire or see if we can't Richard. save him. Richard. Okay. I forgot to say, what happened, what happened to the one that went in the water, John? Sorry. He appears to have disappeared below the water. You've not seen him resurface. Okay. I'll, I'll be looking for him as well. Not going after him, but just looking over the boat just in case he okay. does. Okay. So, around the area. a few, like a couple of minutes later, you spot him as he starts, he's like basically like pulling himself out on the opposite side of the canal. He's obviously like, didn't fancy tangling with you, so he sort of swum over to the other side and he's trying to like pull himself out the other side. I've okay. used ashes to ashes twice, John, and I'm going to feed on the um, unconscious one. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. How much blood are you taking? Are you taking it all? All of it, yeah. Yep, so you can reduce your hunger by... I forget how much it is. I think it clears your hunger if you're killing him, yeah. And then I'm going to use ashes to ashes on that body. Yeah, that's not a problem. So you, you drain all the blood out of this unconscious uh, soldier... Yep. And then you use your necromantic talents to like decay the rest of the bodies away to nothing. Yeah, so the priest, the one in the alley that I killed, and this one are all ashes. Okay. So where the priest was, there is now just ashes and this small sword, which now no longer appears to be glowing. I'm going to get some cloth and pick that up. Yeah, you, you get some cloth, you pick it up. It's a, a very sh short sword, probably about yay long. So fairly, it looks to have been fairly sort of ornately made. It it's made in the sort of standard like cruciform sort of style of most swords. You can see that the the handle is carved so it resembles a a figure with its arms crossed, maybe a saint or something like that. Okay, I'm gonna wrap that up and uh, go to Aurelio. Okay. Not a problem. Obviously, we're effectively not in combat rounds anymore, guys. So, you know, feel free to do what you do. You don't have to do it in strict order now. And in fact, um, I'm is, going to. Are there any other bodies left? Not that you can see now. And in fact, I'm going okay. to move us all oh, back gonna... to the main map because we don't really need that anymore. I yes, think... we all get the hell out of there. Yeah, I think I would have uh, run back to see what happened to the others and tell them that one of them got away well we have a free vote yeah I don't know how uh, 
Yeah, it's a, sm- it's a small boat. It's a boat. their boat, or if it's a, just a real plane. It seems to. A- it seems actually like incredibly plain, almost as though it's like deliberately designed to have like as few identifying features as possible. Yeah. And like I say, it's effectively a, a small motorboat. You could probably fit. You probably fit the four of you in without too much difficulty. More than that, you know, you might start start getting a bit cramped. The maneuverability might start suffering a bit, but you probably squeeze six in at a push. Um, is Raiden still alive? Is he? He is lying on the ground. Like I say, pretty much half of his face is like melted away. Uh, it, to be honest, it's kind of difficult to tell. He's he's not moving. Obviously, he's not breathing. Okay. Um. So I will try and uh, lean down and kind of speak to him and see if he can tell me where Damien is. Okay, so what what do you say to him as you sort of lean down next to him? I guess I just kind of, you know, can wake up right in, uh Where is Damien? Where did they take him? You see, like, his, his one sort of, like, good remaining eye, like, turns your direction. And through his ruined sort of throat, like, half his sort of, like, face around here is sort of like, all melted away. You hear him go, like, Okay. Um so and uh the building they were in, is that door open where they came out? Yeah. The um so I want to very quickly run in there and see if there's any sign of anything valuable or uh, vampire-esque. Okay, so you quickly run inside. There's nothing obviously vampire no. in there. Um, you do find what appears to be like a, a set of like binoculars on like a stand in the, the upper floor where they're obviously observing the across the street from. Um, you can see from the fact that you know, there's like sandwiches and like bits of food and stuff like that left around. They must have been here for like a little bit. You know, they were like prepared to be okay. staking the place out for a while. But you, you probably find like a bit of extra ammunition. There's maybe a couple of pistols there that you can take if you want. Yeah, yeah. But there's nothing major there. Like this, and as you're sort of looking around with your professional opinion, it's as though they've they've actually gone to lengths to leave like as few tracks or traces as possible. Okay. Um, so then I'll run back out and grab Raiden and, and bring him to the boat. Try and yep, get him. No away. problem. Yep. You easily carry him to the boat. That's not a problem. So you guys just put, just all piling into the boat and get out of here. Is it best to take the boat to one of our sort of havens? Havens. Yeah. Like, leave the boat there if anyone wants to keep it. Yeah, we should definitely keep it. Okay. So, are you guys? Where are you guys heading? Are you heading back to your communal haven, or? I don't think that's wise at the moment. weren't we going to a town square somewhere? Or well, originally? <clears throat> Not as far as I recall. Hmm. In fact, as you sort of think about it, Sonia, the only, the only other thing you recall that you were supposed to be doing this evening is you were. You were supposed to be going and picking up your outfits for the, uh, for the Hikata uh, family gathering. Okay, you... I shall find some form of cloth to wrap around myself as I'm mostly naked now because I've got a shotgun blast. Well, luckily for you, it just so happens that like Aurelio came out of the house like carrying a big sheet. Uh, which um, let's talk about that. So. Um, anything in the house that would be incriminating as far as vampires? Um, not, not as far as you can see. Bagged that. <laughs> yeah. Because he's not going to go looking for like, oh, did, did they plaster a corpse in a wall? No. Yeah. Uh, but anything just no, visible. Not as far not, as you can see, uh, but um, knowing what you know of the tourists, they tended to sort of like feed while they were out and away from the haven on the sort of like the tourists of Venice, you know, mm-hmm. the sort of while they were partying. They didn't tend to sort of feed near the haven, so it's not surprising you don't find anything obviously vampiring. Yeah. The only thing you do notice that you're like, oh, I see, 
is that when you get into the top floor, it's like a big attic, and in there mm. there are three or four like very large, you know, like the sort of tea chests in the big old mm. sort of chests, and you're like, oh, like improvised uh, sleeping arrangements. It's, mm-hmm. it's pretty obvious. You see, like you know, a couple of them have got like blankets in them that they've probably been in, instead of sleeping down in the actual beds, they've probably been sleeping in these big chests up here in this room, which only has like one small window in it, which is covered over. Yeah, um, I will have thrown open the uh, that window and grabbed a bunch of the blankets. Come down, throw the blankets on the on the bed that I ruffled up and uh, eventually come out and uh, Sonia, if you, if you need something uh, as far as fabric goes, uh, I've got a a sheet for a toga. That will have to do. <laughs> yep. Maybe I can tie it somehow. I don't know. Um... Okay, so what's the plan, guys? One of the um, people in this coterie were female, weren't they? Yeah, that was the um, that was Valerie Reyes, who was the the person who originally like turned you on to this. Um, okay, I'm going to go and try and find some clothing. <laughs> oh, in the in the building. Yeah, yeah, that that's not a problem. You, you can find some clothing. As I said earlier, there is some clothing in the bedroom. I mean, it's yeah, not it's not much, but though. yeah, you might find like a, a pair of jeans and a t-shirt. Yeah, that'll do. And then uh, we better go to get our outfits. Okay, not a problem. So you, um, so I think I'll take um, Raid and his very badly injured somewhere else and I guess the guys can pick up my outfit for me um, and I'll have my retainer come and feed him and try and bring him back to life yeah you, you can tell that he's he's effectively still alive but he's taken a, a large amount of what looks to you like in game terms aggravated damage um, you know yourself that like normal damage you know from like a gun or a, a blade or something like that or a fall or something like that Vampires can heal it fairly quickly, whereas aggravated damage, which normally you get from like fire and sunlight and stuff like that, that takes a good deal longer to heal. So he probably will be all right, like you say, with your retainer feeding him, but it's going to be a while before he's good to go out in public, shall we say, to be a yes. diplomatic about it. But yeah, okay. So the rest of you head further into Canareggio to head to Riolo's. As I say, this as as much as you remembered it, this exclusive small wooden tailor shop, faded wooden sign, set back a bit from the the main tourist area of Canareggio. There's dummies in the window with everything from modern suits to carnival designs, etc. Before we get there, John, I'm going to pull Aurelio into an alleyway yeah. and show him this sword that I've picked up. Yeah. And um, just basically explain that it was glowing when the priest was using it. Uh, I shall open my unseen senses, John, to glance at the blade. Okay, no problem. You glance at the blade with your unseen senses. And to your unseen eye, it, it doesn't cast out the rays that you saw previously emanating from the building. However, as you look at it now to your enhanced senses, you can see what appears to be very faintly glowing writing sort of along mm-hmm. the blade, written in what appears to be Latin. And mm, which it's... I speak. Indeed, and it's very familiar to you. It appears to be the Lord's Prayer in Latin. Mm-hmm. And he's faintly, almost in the sort of like moon, dwarven moon runes from like Lord of the Rings style, sort of glowing on the blade. Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll just mutter as 
Father Noster, qui esses in Celis, Sancti Saturn Nomen Tum. Yes, it is. It is. I'll put a finger on the inscription. Okay, that is absolutely fine. Make me a. I've got this written down. Hold on a second. Make me a stamina resolve roll. I think this is going to do it. I'm sure it did. Okay, so you you touch the blade and it feels like painfully hot to the touch, but it doesn't actually do you any damage and you withdraw your finger pretty okay. quickly. Okay. You get the feeling that like, if you'd have grabbed hold and you'd have held on for a bit, mm-hmm. it may have started to burn you because it was painfully hot. It was like, you know, if you if you turn a tap on and the water comes out hotter than you're expecting, and you quickly, like, instinctively, like, pull your hand away. Yeah. It's that sort of affair. And um, a- as he does that, Sonia, for just a few seconds, you see, like, a flicker of, like, a very faint... Nothing like when the priest was using it, but a very faint sort of glow. And for just a couple of seconds, you can make out, like, the writing on the blade, sort of glowing. But then when Arino you know, yoinks his finger away, the writing instantly fades away. That's interesting. <clears throat> uh, we better stash this away. Okay, it's... what? In the canal or what? Uh, no, no, we, we, we might want to hang on to this. Um, then it's all it's... yours. Oh. Uh... Uh, so, did you have something to wrap it in? Yeah, he wrapped it. Uh, in yeah, cloth. wrapped yeah, it in cloth. Yeah. 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 So I'll. Uh, I guess if you got clothes from the, the building, I have my sheet. So I'll, I'll wrap it up in a sheet, and uh, under the cassock it goes. Yeah. So <laughs> it's already wrapped in one layer of cloth. You wrap it in a second layer of cloth. Yeah. And then you mostly say, to hang it up because yeah. I don't have a scabbard belt. <laughs> yeah, and like I say, it's only it's only fairly small. Luckily, so you like disappear into your cassock. That's not a problem. And touching it through the cloth doesn't appear to cause you any problems. Okay. All right to to the shop. Indeed. So you're met at the shop by the Riolo Putanescu. This this older gentleman, graying hair, wearing a a very smart suit, vaguely reminiscent of a naval uniform, graying beard and beard and moustache, quite a polite but sort of very old voice. But he appears, as we've said before, unusually sprightly for his age. He, as you walk in, the little sort of bell on the door goes, and he walks out with a, a smile on his face, twitching his uh, moustache, and he says, "Ah, right, it's it's good to see you, uh, you again." I ha- I have your I have your orders ready. Uh, th- this this way this way, and he uh, he sort of gestures, and then he says uh, uh, he shows you to like two sort of like little cordoned off sort of booths, you know, like little framework with, like cloth, and he says, oh the uh, the, the 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 clothes are, are are in there if you if you would care to go and try them on. I have, I have the last few final adjustments to make, but the garments are almost complete. Um, please. Uh, you are the customer. Your your satisfaction is the the most important thing to me. Please take your time. Go in, inspect, uh, try them on as you see fit. They are they are all currently in garment bags. Uh, I have I have labelled them for your convenience. Uh, I will I will be in the the front of the shop. Should you have any questions or queries, or should you need anything further? And then he sort of, he, he bows in an almost sort of like courtly manner and he sort of withdraws backwards and disappears into the front of the shop leaving the three of you stood in front of these like couple of booths I shall go and find my outfit John and okay so you head in obviously like they're, they're labeled with your names yours is a strapless sort of shimmering uh, blue dress with a sort of quite a sort of fancy sort of white underlayer the 
the material that's used almost has a sort of a vaguely pearlescent look to it so as you sort of hold it up and you look at it in the light occasionally it like catches the light and a sort of shimmer appears to like run through this fabric and it almost reminds you of the, the sort of moonlight dancing on the, the waves of the canal outside it's obviously a dress meant to impress and to turn heads and it's been created by someone who professed himself to be a master tailor and seems to have the skills to pay those particular bills for yep. for the rest of you Aurelio yours is a a very sort of smart sort of slightly more sort of modernish blue suit and again it appears to have this sort of slightly sort of shimmering almost like two-tone sort of effect on it but when the light catches it at certain angles certain bits of it appear to like reflect the light in an almost sort of silver pearlescent color and then of course we have franco you have a, a black shirt and top hat and you have a two-tone purple and blue dinner jacket which depending on how the light catches it seems to ripple between a dark sort of plummy purple and this sort of deep azure watery blue and of course Hugo's outfit is there as well and that is a blue again similar two-tone blue gray suit with a white suit and a pair of white dinner gloves and they're also like neatly folded up and in these sort of garment bags like hanging up for you to have a look at whilst i'm getting dressed john i'm gonna phone my sire <clears throat> okay not a problem so you're contacting romano petrocelli is that correct yes that's correct okay so as the first time we've met uh, romano petrocelli tell us a bit about your sire what's your sire like i'd say he's a he's a deep-throated man yeah um he's quite particular about the company he keeps okay and uh as a prominent member of the mafioso he's currently uh shoring up businesses within europe okay so mafia shoring up business in europe and looking at the, the notes we've got here, I can see that uh, Romano sort of sees himself as a like a, a parental figure to you, but and you're sort of like the rebellious sort of like youngster. Would that be correct? Yes, that's, that's about right. Yeah. Okay, no problem. So you you call the number of your sire, and a voice on the other end says, "This is Romano. Who is speaking?" Sire, it is I, Sonia. Oh, my child, why do you so rarely call? Have you forgotten your your old sire? Ah, that is the trouble with you, you young kindred nowadays. No respect. But tell me, what is it that prompts you to call me at this hour? I believe we've just um, encountered the Inquisition in Venice the church mm. yes it is not altogether unsurprising when I heard of the recent family gathering that is to be taking place I warned them that collecting us all in one place would bring unwanted attention there are even when we were feuding with each other the, the reason we ended it was because there were so many external threats and those threats have not ceased I told them it would be dangerous getting us all together but my voice was drowned out by those in their effort to sweep the old the old ways under the carpet and maintain this facade of family loyalty well, I've just found to warn you to expect um, a possible company during the event. I wouldn't put it past them to have more than one team in the area. 
alas, I will not be attending the gathering. As you may or may not be aware, a number of my business associates recently have been arrested and incarcerated. I am currently gathering support from my resources, shall we say, to see what can be salvaged and who can be released. Unfortunately, it is business that has taken me to Europe and I will not be back in time for the family gathering. However, in my absence, I give you license to speak for me at the event. This is not something to be taken lightly, my child. I'm aware of your rebellious streak. Consider this a, a test, if you will, to see if you are perhaps worthy of taking on greater responsibilities within our organization. Represent me well, and there may be better things for you in the future. On this occasion, sire, I will do you proud. I hope so. Is there anything else, my child? No, it was just to warn you of the possible threats. Uh, at which point you hear someone say something in the background you don't catch, and then you hear your sire talking to them in a, another language, you think maybe like French? You're not sure? Okay. And, and then, obviously, like, let's put the hand over the phone, turn around, talk to someone else, then comes back to, to you and says... Uh, very well then, my child. I I will await another call from you after the gathering to to inform me of what has transpired there. And hopefully, as I've said, you. thank you. And hopefully, as I've said, better things, bigger things for you in the future. Thank you, sire. Be well, my child. And then, Uh, at this point, I'll probably have to call the um, shop assistant in to do the buttons or something on this dress because yeah. I didn't take um, multi jointed as a merit. <laughs> yeah, not a problem. You you call Riolo back in, and the the old Putanescu man, Master Taylor, comes back in, and sort of looks at you and says, "Ah, a, a, a vision." a vision and sort of holds his hands up and Thank then you. says I, I i trust you are happy with the the work that these these humble hands have have stitched and sewn in in your honor my lady i'm always happy ah splendid especially when the craftsmanship is done by family of course family is <clears throat> of great importance uh, you, know, you you called me in is there anything i can I can assist, or you have questions? If you could finish doing the uh, buttons of this dress, please, so you can get your final measurements, that'd be fantastic. Ah, of course, he, he goes around the back, buttons up the dress, then takes out from his inside pocket a, a tape measure, takes a few measurements, and then says, uh, yes, I think this will this will do nicely, just a, a couple of darts required here, and uh, then I believe we've done it. It shouldn't take me more than half a day, no more. Excellent news. Um, as we are family, I'm also going to warn you. There are inquisition in the area. It, it looks like you blankly says, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, they hunt your masters. Ah, ah. well, I am. Uh, <laughs> I have a. I'm not a privileged enough to know the, the business of my masters, but I. I thank you greatly for, for the warning that you're providing. I will pass it on to my sponsors. Thank you. No, not at all. Thank you. And then he, he turns to, obviously, Aurelio and Franco, you've got your outfits as described, and he says, and gentlemen, are you, uh, are you happy with your outfits? Do you mind if I take the, the last few measurements so we can, we can get them finished up for you? Yeah, I like to think I've been here before. Yeah, you, you probably have. In fact, you've probably got like a, a discount money card. around. So, uh, yeah. Yes, my good man. If you can uh, do the honours. I'll sort of hold my arms out. And sort of okay. He moves over and he's sort of going like that with the tape measure when 
you hear the, like the doorbell in the front of the shop go again he says oh, my, my, my apologies sir so just give me a few moments and he uh, he walks back into the front of the shop and you hear a you hear quite a sort of him having a conversation it's fairly loud so you can hear it with no problems and he, he seems to be talking to quite a, a deep voiced man and you hear this deep voiced man say uh, yes i've come about the the special outfit that i ordered he says ah yes yes of course uh, it, it, it was difficult to to meet your exact um, specifications but if you just hold on a moment it's uh, it's in the back I'll, um, I'll go and get it and the voice says uh, yes if you could be quick about it i've got other things to do yeah yes yes of course so he, he moves into the back room which is where you guys are heads over to where there's some like other garment bags like hanging on these rails he takes he takes a bag down and as he's sort of like moving past you guys to go back in the front you can see that it appears to be like a a black dinner jacket white shirt uh a black top hat set of white gloves similar to the ones that are in a yugo's outfit and like a, a shiny pair of like black leather shoes and he he walks out to the front and he says so he says ah, ah here you go baron this this should meet your uh, exacting specifications and you hear the voice say well it uh, it, it all looks all right do you mind if i uh, take a look at the take a look inside no no of course not is it and then you hear him say oh obviously you can't see this through the back but you hear him say oh do you mind no no of course so the customer's wishes are are all as paramount at riolos and then you hear what sounds like a a cigarette lighter and a few moments later you can like smell like cigarette smoke a couple of seconds pass when not much is said then you hear him say yes that seems uh, most satisfactory and you hear Riola say um, how, how would you like to pay for this band would you like to pay via card and there's a, a loud deep booming laugh for, and he says no ca cash always cash and you hear like what sounds to you like a bag of like heavy coins so it being like thunked down on a hard surface and he says so that should be more than enough to cover the cost of this. I I don't really keep track of this sort of thing. But thank you for your work, uh, Master Putinescu. I'm sure I I'm sure I shall be the the bell of the ball in this outfit. And again there's this another sort of like deep throaty laugh. He takes the you hear like the sound of the the garment back as it's being like passed over. And then you hear Riola said, oh, not at all, sir. Of course, um, family is incredibly important to me. Uh, I hope I hope the outfit brings you joy and you you enjoy the, the, the gathering that's taking place. Uh, I'm sure I will, Master Putinescu. And your work, as always, is exceptional. Would you would you like one? Um, no, no. Uh, thank you for the offer. Uh, thank you for the offer, Baron, but... Uh, no that's fine well in which case i shall leave you to your business thank you again master putanescu good evening to you and then you hear like footsteps heading towards the door there's the tinkle of the bell door shuts again after a few moments we all like putanescu comes back into the the back room and he says oh s sorry about that uh, sir he says to you franco uh, uh, another customer uh, now where will we and he, he takes out the the measurement he takes all the measurements and he's like yes yes that that should be fine uh he, he looks over at your radio and says do you mind if i please he, he does the same on you take text the measurements and he says yes as i was saying to a, I i was saying to your charming friend there and he gestures at uh, sonia it should take me no more than half a day to make the last couple of alterations to to these outfits and they should be ready uh your your friend it's not here, he says, gesturing at the bag that contains Hugo's garments. Um, yeah, he had, uh, he had to attend to another matter. So um, uh, uh, he asked well, us to pick it up in his absence. He says, well, I'm a, I, will, I will, of course, leave the matter to yourself. I am, I'm sure that my, my measurements, the, the visual measurements that I took are 99 percent accurate obviously i would pref as, a, as a 
Taylor, I would prefer to have taken the last measurements more exactly as I've done with yourselves. But it, it is up to you. Either your friend can can visit me here on a another occasion, or you can take it now. Like I say it is it is perfectly wearable. It may not be quite as uh, excuse the the phrase figure hugging, but it, it's still the work of a master tailor. If I do say so myself, it it's up to you. Do you want to take the do you want to take the garment with you now, or would you think your friend? I try, to... I certainly trust your work. Oh, I shall take thank it. You, sir. Thank I shall you. take it, and uh, if there is any major alterations required, then he can always stop by. I'm sure it'd be fine. Oh, well, of course, it is there in the, uh, the the garment bag with the with your friend's yep. name on it. Um, please feel free to. Obviously, I know you. I, I know, sir, as a as a long and valued customer of our establishment. Of course, I, I know that you've already paid for all of this, so that is fine. Feel free to feel free to take your friend's garment, and if you return tomorrow evening, I will have the final alterations made to all of yours, and then, of course, you can collect when suits you most. Thank you. Oh, not at all. It's it's my pleasure. As you say, family is important. All right, we shall leave you alone. Excellent work. I look forward to the final fitting tomorrow. You are too kind, my lady. You are too kind. And with that, I'll just head towards the door. Okay, not a problem. You leave Riolo's. As you leave, you can see sort of down the street, this person who was previously in there appears to be a a dark-skinned man wearing a, a fairly smart suit. He appears to have, like, taken his suit out of the document, well, document garment bag, and appears to have, like, put the suit on. He's now got this top hat on. You can see him sort of stood under a street lamp. He's holding, like, a big sort of fat, like, Winston Churchill-style cigar in his hands. And he's just sort of like, let, there's a light drizzle falling by now, and he's just sort of leant over, covering it with his hand while he's like flicking a lighter with his thumb. And after a few moments, you see this like red coal light up at the end of it as he takes a drag on this big cigar and blows out a voluminous cloud of smoke. Is he recognizable, this, to any of us? Hmm. Probably not to yourself, um, perhaps to Sonia and Aurelio. <laughs> do, do you have any? Do you have any backgrounds or abilities that would enable you to like know other Hikata or other clan members? <clears throat> or to be fair, um, if, to be fair, Fra Franco, if you've if you've got any abilities that might let you know like other vampires or anything like that, or backgrounds or anything like that. Probably know he's a vampire, but other than that, uh... no, I've got nothing. I've okay. got a data of status with the Hecata. Okay, so what I'm going to suggest, probably a little bit un unorthodox, this, but hey, if you make me a a wits roll, but you can add one dice to it to represent your status. We'll see how many successes you get, Aurelio. And if you get a decent number, you might vaguely recall something about this guy. Wits, was it? Yeah, wits plus one. Oh. Oh, no. Double wits. Uh, to be fair, that is what you're supposed to do when you make a, just a roll based on, a, on an attribute, so that's fine. Ah, right, right. Okay, well, there we go. <laughs> okay. So you you don't recognise him personally. Like I say, he just appears to be a, a large, dark-skinned man, bald head, top hat, black suit, gloves, smoking a big cigar. However, you did hear him referred to as the Baron in the shop, and you know that amongst one of the the extant lines of the Hikata, one of the old lines known as the, the Samadhi, who basically fled the, the Giovanni persecution, they fled to, like, Haiti, and areas like that allegedly they have 
either a, a powerful spirit or a vampire, no one seems sure, called the Baron, who was like the top dog of that bloodline, who was responsible for getting them all to safety and sort of integrating them into like Haitian society. But no one's exactly sure like what he is. When you speak to some people, they're like, oh, he's, he's like a voodoo lover, some sort of like demigod. Others are like, oh, he's just like a wraith, a powerful wraith. Others are like, oh, he's just like a, an older vampire. No one really seems to know. His, his origins are a bit sort of shrouded in mystery. And like, even like descriptions of him tend to vary a little bit. And you would, you would know, given as a result of your five successes, that before the consolidation of the Hikata, all of the Samadhi were marked with sort of like skeletal or like rotting corpse-like faces in a vaguely similar way to some of the kindred who were a bit more nearer to yourself, shall we say. But they resembled sort of like rotted, like bloated corpses, whereas since the consolidation of the Hikata, they no longer seem to suffer from that weakness. Although some of them do still maintain it, but it's not a universal thing. And this guy certainly doesn't look like a, a skeletal corpse. He's like, say, just like a dark skinned, bald man in a sharp suit. Mm -hmm. um, I'll uh, elbow Sonia and says, I think this one's family. I'll uh, try and make an introduction then. Hmm. And with that, John, I shall set off down the street to find this man. Yeah, he's like I say, he's basically leaning up against the uh, the lamppost, sort of smoking his uh, his big cigar. As you get nearer, you can just see what looks to be like a uh, the edge of like a bottle, like poking out from the inside of his uh, the inside pocket of his jacket. As you as you walk over, are you saying anything as you walk up? Yeah, I'll, I'll go. Excuse me, sir. He, he he turns around and he. He sees you, smiles, and as as you sort of get in, there's like a a scent of like rum and like tobacco that seems to like fill the air around him. He he smiles at you and he says, "Well, aren't you a pretty thing?" <laughs> Thank you, sir. I have been um, reliably informed that we may be related. He like he peers at you for a few moments, and then he says, "Well, I think we just might be." So, as I have been given such a prestigious power by my sire today, <clears throat> I must warn you of the um, church in the area. <laughs> he laughs and he says, "The church." Yes, the hunters. Oh, I see. He says, well, it's hardly surprising, is it, given where we are and what's going on? Not exactly, but as your family, I would um, find it in my best interest to ensure that you are also informed. I very much appreciate that, child. He says, Tr trust the fucking church to make a, an already complicated situation <laughs> even more complicated. And he, at which point he takes the uh, he takes the bottle out from his coat. You can see there's like a red liquid inside it. He unscrews the cap. It's like a rum bottle. He takes a swig of it, and then he sort of holds it out to you. Yeah, probably quite low down as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's pretty tall, so he sort of holds it down. Yeah, it's a, a good size comparison. I'll take a drink. Yeah, you you take a swig of it. It's blood. Um, it's obviously blood from someone who's drank like an awful lot of alcohol. You you would guess mostly rum by like the sort of taste and flavour you get off the blood. He, he smiles and says, "That'll keep that'll warm your cold dead heart on a night like this." And he sort of looks around and breathes out a cloud of smoke. Now while this is going on, what are Aurelio and Franco doing? I'm sort of trying to listen in. Well, yeah, this, this guy's pretty loud. You can yeah. hear him. It's not a problem. Yeah, but I don't want to be like within the uh, 
I don't know. So he he doesn't see me close up. I just um, still a bit wary after um, my visit to the underwater <laughs> zone of of some of the Hikaru. Uh, so yeah, I'm just trying to listen in if uh, if I can hear anything that might be useful for the gathering. Yep, not a problem. Information, etc. How about yourself, Aurelia? I guess just observing from a from a distance. Um, okay. Not sure what's the deal. What's the deal with this guy? And uh, also absent-mindedly pondering that I should be elsewhere, probably doing a bit of ritual work. Okay. So, Sonia, the the the, the Baron, says. I take it you're attending this this family gathering then? I will be, sir, yes. Ah, splendid. Splendid. It's good to know it won't all be stuffy old uh, Giovanni and Cappadocians sat around debating matters that should have been dead hundreds of years ago. No pun intended. <laughs> he says, yes, to be honest, I was... Uh, I was thinking about skipping the matter entirely, but uh, some of the some of the younger members of my line are are very keen to that the reconciliation efforts in our family should succeed. So, in order to keep them happy, I've uh, I've recently flown in. Not really my thing. These sort of. Uh, these longer family gatherings and these are a little bit too much like a business meeting, if you ask me. Unfortunately, so. But we will we will see what we see there. Uh, hopefully, they're going to, as well as all the all this rot about uh, the family reunion consolidation of the of the Hikata. Hopefully, they're they're finally going to get round to decide to do something about the promise. That's mainly why hope. I'm here. I can hope they'll finally look into that issue. Indeed. Well, I can appreciate the difficulties given that... Uh, given how difficult it is to pin down any details about that particular agreement. But we really should start looking at it sooner rather than later. And I've, I've got to... I managed to winkle out a few, few choice facts of my own that I... That I might throw in, you know, just to see what the what the family make of it, you know, stir the pot, so to speak. I look most interested in hearing them. Perhaps I could escort you. Why, yes, normally I would have brought um, one of my wives with me, but uh, we didn't want to risk moving all of the, the line. I, I would be more than happy to be escorted by yourself. Excellent. I will have um, Franco, Aurelio, and Hugo. So um, we should be able to provide ample support for you. Splendid, splendid. Uh, well, if you should uh, ever find yourself at a. I'm sorry, well, what is your name, child? Sonia. Sonia Mele. I oh, guess you're a. Uh... You're Romano's child, aren't you? That is correct, sir. Well, if you should ever, uh, if you should ever desire to uh, slip the uh, the bonds of the, the the stuffy traditionalists amongst our kind, uh, I always have room for more wives. Most kind. Not at all. Not at all. And he reaches inside his jacket takes out a, a cigar case, sort of flips it open, you see all these like sort of Havana style cigars in there, holds yeah. the the tray out to you. I'll take a cigar here. He lights it for you, takes a chuff on his own and says, uh, well, I will leave you to your business, uh, Sonia. I look for, if you are escorting me to the gathering, is there a place where I might call on you at the appointed hour 
Of course. And I will give him the address. Okay, so where where are you planning for the Baron to meet you? Let's see, let's look at the old map. Where's the meeting taking place? Okay, the meeting is taking place in... Da, da, da. Let me just find the thing for it. It's taking place in the Ristorante alla Carone in San Marco. So, down here. Yeah. And it's basically on the edge of the canal. It's a restaurant that backs directly onto the canal. In that case, then we'll go for a meeting at the Rosa de Escobada in okay. Rialto. Okay, not a problem. Okay, so the Baron wishes you well and then departs. Well, good job well done there, I'll say to Aurelio. We're going to escort the Baron. To, to where? To the um, family gathering. So you're getting quite a little, uh, quite a little group together because you've got the Nosferatu representative going with you as well. <laughs> and a right little posse to roll in there. Wonderful. He seemed uh, most worried about the promise. I wonder why. Um, I, well, not much to be done unless the people with the big shoes make some moves, I suppose. Well, that's, that's what he's aiming for. Okay. So, whilst all this is going on, obviously, you go. You have headed back to the communal haven. You are taking uh, Raiden Scott with you. You get back there. You arrange for your your retainer to, to start feeding him. You, you check him over. You don't think he's in any more immediate danger. He basically just needs time to and blood to recover, but it will take him some time. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and then I think I'm uh, also very badly injured, so I'll just try and uh, start feeding and also feeding off my retainer and trying to recover. Okay, not a problem. Obviously, Valerie Reyes, the other injured Anarch, is also at your communal haven. Obviously, she, she went there like, seeking help from you guys. She's She's overjoyed to see Raiden. She tries getting a bit of information out of him about what happened to that other missing member, uh, Damian Campbell, but obviously he's in no condition to tell her. And she's she's pretty much sort of helping your retainer to like look after him. Because although she is like, a, 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 she's, she's a little bit injured, but nowhere near as badly as him. Yeah. Um... Yeah, and then I think I'm the same. I'm a little quite badly injured, so I kind of want to just do a little bit of feeding and a little bit of healing and just kind of relax. Okay, yeah, not a problem. And you do indeed relax and you begin to start your healing. So I'm just going to have a look at the... See if I've got any the rules of the healing written down. Da, 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 da. don't appear to have but I will look that up later so 
Does anyone else have anything they wish to do with this evening? Otherwise, as I suggested previously, we'll sort of speed ahead a little bit. I'm pretty much done. I think the only thing I could think of was um, your laptops being hacked. Yeah, but I think I'm waiting for him. Yeah, he, ba that. he basically said he'd call you um, when he'd managed, to, if and when he'd managed to get into the other laptops. So yeah, I think a retreat to Haven is probably okay. Not a problem. So I'm going to say that two nights have passed. So we would now be on the seventh of January, the Saturday, which is two days before the gathering is due to take place. I'm going to say that obviously you'll have all that opportunity to feed, so you can all knock your hunger down to one. If you so wish, because you would have had plenty of opportunity to feed. I am, however, once you've knocked your humanity down to one, I am going to ask you all to make a single rouse check just to see if like, it fluctuates. I'm going to make one check. Okay. Sure. Oh. So, a couple of days later, Aurelio, you're at your personal haven, like you say, doing some of your ritual stuff, you know, preparing yourself, etc. When you notice the, the temperature in the room begins to drop and you see a familiar conglomeration of shadows gathering in the corner of the room and you recognise the telltale presence of those who were taken too soon by God, the, the conglomeration, the the conjoined spirit that you have bound by ritual art to serve you and as it solidifies you hear the, the sort of whispered hissing voice of the spectre saying i have been watching the place you designated and your people are preparing enchantments and wards around the location to bar the passage of my kind they are not yet active but they have nearly completed their preparation I have also seen several of your kind lurking below the waters observing the same location also a group of humans, sorry also a group of humans who seem to Didn't. be observing the building yeah um cook some chicken up i need to just do some i would say that you hasten back and cross the threshold and remain there um uh, until such a time that uh, myself and my compatriots arrive so that you will be beyond the wards when they finish. Very well, although once the wards are erected, I may not be able to leave. If that is what you wish. And immediately you feel the, the presence mm -hmm. start to recede and the shadows start returning to normal, the temperature rises a bit as the spectral presence withdraws. Okay. And so now Aurelius just crossing his fingers that the, the completion of the wards doesn't expose the, uh, <laughs> the wraith from inside. Indeed. In the, the time that has passed, you go your your outfit for the Hikata gathering has been delivered to you. As we said, it's this blue gray suit with a white suit, white shirt and uh, dinner gloves. Uh, if you wish during like, the two days that have passed, you can have visited Riolo's and got like your fitting, etc. So it's all snug, not a problem. Yeah, I think I've done that. Yep, no problem at all. He's, he's delighted to see we takes all the measurements, uh, does it very quickly. Uh, within that same period of time, the rest of you will pick up your outfits as well. 
the the final alterations having been made to them okay so it's two days before the the hikata gathering is due to take place is there anything you guys want to do prior to that uh, all i was gonna say is um i was meant to be getting some security stuff for our our haven like some uh, cameras or something from the laptop guy i can't remember if That's we security cameras yeah, we can yeah. we can easily say you've sorted that out over the, the two days. Obviously, the money's not an issue for you. So yeah, you've okay. you've set up each like set the security cameras up outside, or you set them up inside the haven as well. Um, yeah, I do inside as well. I'll get you know some sort of eight camera system or something. And so you can't go full NOS for our two camera system. Yeah. <laughs> uh, get it linked up to a. Whoever's got the the best mobile or something to identify. Okay, so log in and sort of check it out. Yeah, so not a problem. You can, I'll say to be honest, like you can you can set it up so you can all check it on your mobile if you wish. That's not a problem. Because you obviously your your rich as anything, so you can buy like top of the line stuff. Um, in terms of the cameras, do they like record footage or is it just like a live link? If if you want them to record stuff, where do you want that to be stored? Like you're gonna have like a computer in your haven or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I, th I think I'd probably want it. Um, I don't want it. Yeah, I mean, I'd I'd have it local. I think. Yeah, I don't know if I'd trust anyone enough to store the information somewhere else. So yeah, um, I'll have it sort of set up so it's into the uh, loft area. It's storing onto a hard drive up there, and just you know every couple of weeks it'll just overwrite if, if we haven't done anything with it sort of thing. okay not a problem and I will ask him obviously about the laptops while I'm there if, yeah he, yeah, he, he tells you he's, um, he's still working on it as he in his yeah. sort of excitable way he reaffirms again that it's like next level encryption and he's still sort yeah. of trying to like work his way through he says he's made some progress but he says there's there's that much, there's like multiple layers of security on each of the laptop. Okay. Obviously, whoever this guy was who was investigating this strange sort of online puzzle really didn't want other people getting into it. And he does say that looking through some of the, the online correspondence from the couple of laptops he did manage to get into, it's clear that this guy and like his sort of little online group weren't the only groups online that were trying to that we're trying to solve it there, there, there's quite a bit of like competitiveness between these various yeah. anonymous groups of people online all trying to solve this puzzle okay yeah okay so i think what we're going to do there now guys is we're going to call a quick five minute break you know or go and grab a drink etc use the facilities we'll come back in five minutes and see what you guys want to do next yeah. okay back cool. in five yep Wait for the others to get back. Yeah. <clears throat> Glad our priest has gone. Well, yeah, I'll bet. Well, that reminds me, I'm going to see if I can look up the rules on healing while we're waiting. I think I found um, that it's one point per day, one point per night. It's on page 127. Yeah, I'll just find it in the index. 127. There we go. Healing. Yeah, aggravated damage. Yeah, vampires can mend one level of aggravated health damage each night by rousing the blood. So each night, in addition to, if you want to heal an aggravated damage, in addition to your roll to wake up, you have to rouse the blood to heal that aggravated damage. 
So we've effectively okay. had two nights. So if you and I believe it was um, Sonya also took some aggravated damage. If you guys want to make, you can make up to two rolls for that. Okay. Okay, so you, you still heal, but your hunger's gone up. So you've healed one ag, so you get another one. Okay, so you've healed two of your aggravated damage. Okay. And yet you've healed yours, Sonya, but obviously also your hunger's gone up by one as well. Okay, so we have to wait for Yannis to get back and then we'll crack on. I need to feed John. Okay, not a problem. So we can we can sort that out now so what sort of feeding method are you using uh, same as last time i'll get a professional that's into the um, bdsm scene and go and feed on them because i've got to beat them about a bit okay and whereabouts are you planning what sort of area are you planning on feeding it uh well i'll do it privately so i'll book a hotel room and so, so we say that a, a slightly more respectable area of the city. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not a problem. So, uh, let's see you effectively. So it's manipulation plus persuasion. For the method you're using. two manipulations so. yeah that's absolutely fine and i'm gonna ask uh, darren can you please roll me a d50 eight okay so randomly <laughs> the the person who turns up who you feed on Sonia is obviously into this scene because of how you've organized it but there's a little bit of chit chat before the feeding you find out that the the person you're feeding on actually lives in Tronchetta which if you remember is the the only district you can drive motor vehicles in legally in Venice yep. and it turns out that this person is a one of the few bus drivers in Tronchetta but yeah you yep. how much are you planning on feeding on them? What's the safe limit? Okay, the most sort of non-harmful drink you can do is you can lower your hunger by two. I'll do that then. That'll take me down to one. Yep, not a problem. So yeah, so you you feed on this uh, this bus driver who's sort of like obviously like doing a bit of moonlighting in the scene, so to speak. <laughs> And uh, yeah, you, you head on your way with relatively little incident. Fair, I'll do it as well, John. That's okay. okay. What method do you want to use to feed by? <clears throat> um, I uh, I am an alley cat predator type, so I'm presuming that's more of a um, yeah, that, that strength brawl. Grab someone, drag them into yeah, yeah. and feed on them. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, okay. robbery gone wrong. So, so make your roll, and I'm going to ask Johannes, can you please roll me a d50? Uh, seven. Okay. So this is a brawl roll, is it? It's a strength brawl, yeah. Strength brawl, okay. It's a ten. Okay, okay yep, yeah, not a problem. So, it's not a best of failure because you've got a success, which is all you need. Okay. So, your since I presume since you're just grabbing someone, you're in one of the like slummier areas of the city. Yeah, yeah. So you're uh, 
you're sort of lurking around in some dark alleyways on one of these evenings and you see what appears to be a maybe like a construction worker you know he's got like the hard hat and the the like on obviously with venice slowly sort of sliding into the waters there's a lot of construction and shoring up foundations and stuff like that seemingly constantly on the go in the city so it's not unusual to see a fair old amount of construction workers going along you can see like this one's obviously like knocked off his shift he appears to have been like drinking a little bit you know he's just sort of like so shadowing him a little bit you know you can smell the the hooch on his breath and he just he walks past the mouth of the alleyway that you're lurking in and you just like grab him and drag him into the alleyway okay and i'll again heal or i'll feed for two points of hunger okay not a problem you you take the maximum amount of blood you can from this guy i'll be feeling a bit woozy but he won't be harmed by it uh however for the the rest of this evening you are going to be at a minus one to your dex and intelligence because of the amount of alcohol in the guy's system okay. which obviously affects his blood but yeah the, the blood is perfectly nourishing and you feel your hunger abate and you leave him sort of half passed out like deliriously sort of lying amidst like the trash and the rubble in this alleyway and you disappear off into the night with relatively little incident Right, and it's like Dex and Intelligence, you said? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, now as you're making your way down through the various alleyways and crossing the bridges, etc., returning to the communal haven, a young woman approaches you, Hugo, and presses a, a leaflet, a piece of paper, into your hands and then says oh excuse me sir uh, not, not like sort of pushing it to you but you know it like passes it to you and then says oh, excuse me uh, sir do, do you have a do you have a few moments to talk about uh, the the church of bodily ascension the church of bodily ascension y yes sir yes uh, yeah Oh, she seems like quite shocked that someone's like, "Yeah, I'll talk to you about it." Obviously, like a lot of sort of salespeople in inverted commas, she's probably been getting like the runaround. She's, she's a little bit taken aback, and she's, "Oh, I've sprained it." Uh, well, well, yes, the, the the Church of Bodily Ascension. Although we're we're a small sort of new faith, uh, we believe that if you are faithful enough and pure, that the the very hand of heaven itself can reach down and pluck those who are those who you love who are injured who may be suffering and bodily lift them into heaven sparing them pain and sparing you loss isn't that a wonderful idea yes yes that sounds truly wonderful yes. um, well uh, if you are interested um we're actually planning on um, having one of our meetings in a in a few days' time. Uh, the, the, the details are all on the uh, on the the pamphlet I uh, I gave you. Oh yes, and thank yes, you very much. I yes, will uh, consider it and see if I'm free. Yes, yes, we'd love for you to come along, and uh, the, the the address is on there, and uh, it, it's uh, it's taking place in the uh, in the the Dusadoro, uh, district uh like i say the address the address is on the pamphlet it, it'd be lovely if you could come along yeah i'll see what i can do oh well th thank you sir thank you and uh, I, I hope you have a very pleasant evening yeah you too thank you very much and i'll take the leaf listen okay not a problem and she heads off on her way What date was the meeting? The meeting is the 11th. So it is the Wednesday. So it's two days after the Hikata meeting. Okay. Like I it's in Dusadora. Which is down. Yeah. Okay. And then you you continue to the communal haven. Well, I would say for convenience sake, you are all gathered. 
um, obviously feel free to discuss amongst yourself if there's anything else you wish to do prior to the the Hikata gathering obviously because we're, we're getting on a bit we're not going to cover the Hikata gathering this evening my plan will be to like start unless anything else happens that runs over will be to start the Hikata gathering at the start of next session just sort of let you know that in advance we've got a bit more time to sort of explore that rather than trying to cram it in at the end but you're all met up in the communal haven feel free to discuss if there's anything else you wish to do do we have a plan for the gathering we're just going to go and see what happens or yeah we're, we're going to escort the baron and the okay. offer our two entourage okay um so that's quite an undertaking, really. Okay. So we should definitely enter the room with enough um, eyes on us. Okay. And then Nosferatu are very the undersea guys, are they? What's their... How are they related to the Hikarta? They're the Hobbitses. They, <laughs> they they want to make peace or well, at least some of them is, do. Historically they they were they were not on good terms with the uh <clears throat> the Giovanni. Okay. And the Hikarta and the Giovanni are the same? That, kind of? uh, the G Giovanni would be the most numerous current Hikata. Okay. The most populous of the family. Okay. I would say that the uh, the younger members of the Nosferatu uh, are potentially troublemakers and may try and stir things up now they know where the meeting is. Um, it was the uh, the elder that was keen on sort of the more peaceful option so we still need to be a keep our eyes open for that yes eventually. Um, i'm being told that the uh there are observers of the meeting location uh mucking about in the water i presume there's only one uh kind of visitor that could be Not quite sure what the uh, the end result of all this will be. Pandemonium. Do you think I'm in any danger by being there? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Everyone is. It's a it's a table of uh, ostensible family where everyone came with an extra knife that they keep behind their backs. Um, and it's not going to be steak that's going to get cut. I'm talking of knives, sh should I be bringing up some sort of weapon? I wouldn't. Is that done at these things? Well, as far as it goes, they've offered hospitality, so I would expect mm. them to live up to some degree of that hospitality for yeah. an undetermined amount of time. If trouble uh, comes, it's probably not going to come from the organizers themselves. Okay. But that doesn't mean we will be entirely safe with the organizers when trouble kicks off. They will not start it, though. Hmm. It seems uh, we must have our wits about us. Not quite sure what can be done about any uh, well, brethren of yours that are laying in not an ambush, but reserve nearby. Not much, I, I, I guess, but they are there. I know this already. So I expect the hornet's next. Mm. 
And what what is like uh, you guys said? What what do you think the purpose of this meeting is? If if everything went to plan, if everything went smoothly, what? everything goes smoothly then um, legends tell of a wonderful paradise but I think everyone I think goes should definitely a book. <laughs> it's not going to end well no the, as, as far as the agenda goes I think there's going to be uh, airing of various grievances as usual and then uh, I, I suppose some will be bringing forward uh, issues that are more broad. The uh, Baron, as it were, uh, was hinting at uh, something called a promise, which is a, a very esoteric concept. We'll not go into too much detail, but that is something that is uh, not just the Baron's issue that is something that uh, I would say affects the entirety of Venice uh, to a degree. So things like that are uh, brought to debate I would expect. Um, How often do these sort of meetings take place? Uh, when necessary. When someone calls for them. Uh, hmm. I understand there uh, was a little bit more structure in the uh, Days gone by, but th those were the days before the Hecate, when there was only the Giovanni. Well, I say only, but mostly. So someone's calling this, and they will have, I would expect, a thing or two of great importance to put forward to the debate or to state things. That's what I would expect. And what is the etiquette for weapons and explosives? Uh, don't 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 bring a rifle. <laughs> but otherwise I would think that it would be uh, uh, considered somewhat rude if they did not discover at least one weapon on you. Okay. I love that. What's the etiquette for weapons and explosives? <laughs> I would say don't annoy. Don't go looking to provoke. If you turn up armed to the teeth, um, I'm sure they have a very quick and very valid response to that. If you bring something, make sure you can put it in a pocket away from sight very easily. As you're all talking, you hear a you hear a soft sort of cough and you you look around and see Valerie Reyes who has been obviously staying at your sort of communal haven during her recovery and she says, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very sorry to interrupt your conversation but I, uh, I think Raiden's now recovered sufficiently that uh, he can talk although his voice is still a little still a little croaky but he, he seems to be on the mend uh, I know you were trying to talk to me. She obviously nods at you, Hugo. I think he should now be able to to respond. Okay. Um, has he said anything about where Damien is? Uh, no, no, at least not to me. Okay. Well, let's go and ask him. Um, so, I presume he's lying down. So I'm trying to sit down beside him and. Yeah, you can see like he's, um, he's he's still got some some wounds on his face, but like a lot of his <coughs> flesh is like knit back together. Uh -huh. Um it's good to see you on the mend. Um Thank I, you. Uh, uh we still haven't found Damien. Um can you tell us where you last seen him? He says, Well uh, as a uh, as I'm sure Valerie has told you when we were when we were taken by surprise in the, the water taxi, a, a struggle broke out. Uh, we were we, with the, the effects of whatever whatever drugs are in the, the blood that we drank. We were incapacitated. I had a, a, a bag of some kind to put over my head. I heard, 
I heard uh, Damien struggling, but uh, I, I didn't hear anything more. I, I was taken to a, well, it, it looked like a, a, a warehouse or a, a, a fairly empty building, and I was, I was questioned at length. So they were trying to, they were trying to find out all about how many other kindred I knew, um, if I could give them any locations. Obviously, I, I didn't give them any information. Um, they had, well, I don't know what it was. They, well, you saw it, the, the liquid they splashed on I me. Mean, it almost, uh, it, I mean, I saw, sorry, it splashed on them. It didn't seem to do them any harm, but it, it burnt me like it was acid or fire. Uh, I, I think when they, when they realised they weren't going to get any information out of me, they decided to use me to see if they could provoke other kindred into to coming forward and well you saw when that didn't work they I think if it hadn't been for for the intervention of yourselves they they would have no doubt just finished me off hmm. um, and does everyone all the all three of these people know where our communal haven is the, the, the tourists yeah yeah okay. um Um, do you think Damien will tell them of our haven and the other havens, the other secrets that he knows? He, he says, uh, well, I, I shouldn't think so. He's a, he's a incredibly tough, tougher, far tougher than myself. Uh, um, and if, if anyone could give them the slip, uh, he's, as, as a member of Clan Gangrel, he's he's quite proficient in some of their abilities. If anyone could get away from them, it would be him. Okay. And where would he go if he could get away, do you think? Well, he, he has the... He has the capability... I've, I've seen him do it. He has the capability to transform himself into a... the, the likeness of a, a large domestic cat. Uh, I've... From what I've, I know of his history before he, he joined us, he... He pretty much had to rely on himself. I, I would guess he's, I mean, he's a pretty private person, all told. But I would guess he's probably gone to ground somewhere if he's managed, if he did manage to get away from them. He'd probably lie low for a little bit. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Well, get yourself some rest, and hopefully, he has evaded his captors. He, he sort of like gently puts a hand on your arm and he says, "And again, um, my thanks to to yourself and all of your, all of your companions. If I mean, once I've regained my strength, if there's anything I can do to, to repay you all, for for even for myself uh, and Valerie, but please just ask." And he, he seems, we all have to he work seems, together. He seems surprisingly serious, unlike his normal like fun time and art yeah. party guy. Where he's just like, oh, I've had half my face melted off, and uh, it, it's been a bit of a, a rough ride. But yeah, he, he, his eyes are genuinely full of gratitude. Um, okay, so we leave him. Um, I will, I guess, come back to the party and explain that. Damien is still MIA, and he does know where our communal haven is, and he might need to be a little bit cautious. Um, should we have we heard from the other coterie recently? The artist Della Destino. No, you've not heard yeah. from them recently, no. Um, I guess we should probably go and check in with them and let them know what's happening to be on the lookout for. Um, uh, Inquisition type people. Um, they're nearby as well, are they, John? Yes, they are, yeah. So, okay. to, to cut along so you pay a long you pay a visit to them. Their leader, Serafino Vario, who is this sort of quite jaded member of the the Torridor clan, um, she she greets you, welcomes you to their to their haven. 
says, um, please, please come in. Uh, Antonio and uh, Romeo are uh, away on business at the moment, but I'm, I'm holding down the fort, such as it is. If you... It looks like you've got some serious business on your mind if you'd like to you like to sit down and tell me what troubles you and as as you're sort of heading into the haven literally like waves of calm and i suppose you could call it like good vibes sort of like wash off her which anyone who who has any experience of the vampiric power presence will know that like that's what it is it's not like mind control or anything like that it's just like she exudes an aura of calm and sort of peacefulness that sort of rolls off her um, so yeah, I'll just very briefly explain <clears throat> um, that the tourists were attacked by the Inquisition. Um, that we have rescued two of them and slain a priest and a number of his henchmen. Um, but that one of them hasn't been recovered and since that he knows where many of the havens are. Um, just to be on the lookout for priests and strangers and um, and I guess we should agree to stay in touch on the uh, text each other regularly and make sure that you know no one goes missing um, well thank you for telling this us and of course uh, if there's anything we can do obviously let us know although I, I can't say I'm surprised that the and her face sort of like and now sort of like crinkles a little bit. The uh, the Anarchs have got themselves into trouble. They're their incautious, shall we say, to be charitable lifestyle was bound to lead to to trouble sooner or later. It's Indeed. it's why the it's why the, the, the Camarilla are long cleaved to the tradition of the masquerade. After all, whilst we there there can be no doubt that we are physically and mentally superior to the to the kind to the mortals there are far more of them than there are of us they can walk around in the daytime and we cannot and they have technologies that we some of us barely understand it's only a matter of time before someone who shall we say lives a life on the edge as the tourists do finds themselves in a, a spot of hot water Indeed. Um, yeah, so I think we all need to just be on the lookout for strangers. Of course, and uh, thank you for for bringing this to our attention. Of course, I'll let my I'll let Antonio and Romeo know when they return to the Haven. Is there anything else you you need from me? No, I think it was just to make sure that you were safe and that you were warned. Okay, yep, yeah, she she lays a hand on your arm and she says, well, isn't that terribly kind and sweet of you? And at this point, I'm going to ask, can you make me a composure plus wits roll? Uh, composure and wits are about attributes. Is yep, that that's right? Uh, so how do I, I click on so one you, and do the you other? You click on one of them and then you can select, select the other. The other. Yeah. Rolling wits, wits, uh, composure. Sorry, that's all right. Okay, that is pretty poor. Uh, that's one success. Problem. Let me make uh, roll. Okay. So just to clue you in on a, on a sort of game level, the ability known as entrancement, which is a presence-based power, has just been used on you. It can instill a rapt fascination or infatuation akin to falling in love or meeting one's lifelong idol. The effects last for roughly one hour per one point of the margin on the wind, so it'll be four hours, 
for yourself. Okay. Um, basically, if this if she tries doing anything involving like social pulls to you, she'll get like a massive bonus. But you, as I described there, you feel incredibly well disposed towards this vampire. I'll obviously leave that to yourself to to role play. It doesn't really have any like dice mechanics or anything like that. It's just yeah, yeah. Body. But I say you feel like this. This, this incredibly beautiful Toreador is a like you see you get the feeling almost like you're sort of becoming infatuated like slightly falling in love with this person but the the stronger feelings only really last for like four hours in this case but yeah she lays a hand on your arm and says well isn't that terribly kind and sweet for you it does my it does my cold heart good to know that there are still kindred out there who care for their comrades and their companions in the even in a city such as this I well you're too kind oh no not at all not at all my not at all my dear fellow I'm assuming the rest of you are there while this is going on but yeah they're, they seem to be having like a quite a nice friendly chat getting quite close with each other it says um, yes I often think that's the, the the trouble with cities like this you know where there's there's no sort of real strong structure or ties that bind kindred together. I know the I know the Hikata have their, their sort of sense of family, so to speak, but it only really extends to to their own kind, whereas the 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 strength as far as I'm concerned, certainly back in the old days, lamentably not so much now, is that if the Camarilla is that everyone knew their place within it and the the network of favors and relationships that maintained the presence of the camarilla meant that everyone knew who they could rely on who their friends were and who their enemies were whereas things nowadays seem to seem to have got so muddled and so confusing i often think it's a it's a miracle that haven't been far more breaches of the masquerade in, in these modern nights than there have been you're so wise well, it's, it's, it's terribly terribly sweet of you to say so and obviously any of you guys who are watching now will probably get the feeling that like Hugo's not really behaving like his normal self where he's sort of like gazing lovingly at this woman and be like oh you're so wise he said, oh you say the nicest things which isn't really how Hugo behaves generally is there any way of detecting it or not is that something um, unless you've got uh, an ability that allows you to detect like discipline use which I don't know if there is one oh, okay. um, uh -huh. but obviously you can observe the effects and it's pretty clear that, that they're getting quite close she's been speaking to him quite calmly and he seems to be becoming like increasingly infatuated with her, although he's not sort of like endangering himself or doing anything that's like causing any issues. But he's definitely sort of acting out of character. Hugo, it's time to go. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yes, fair lady. Um, you have to go. We have business to see to, but um, perhaps I should call again and. Oh, that, and that we would, could spend more time together. That would be delightful. You are, of course, welcome any time. I say it's so, so rare I get to uh, to step outside the the troubles of my own country and converse with a a, a kind young gentleman like yourself. Uh, please feel free to to visit any time. I will. I look forward to it. As do I. And she makes no attempt to like prevent you from leaving or anything like that, so you can come on, Casanova. <laughs> and I suppose so... as we depart, then um, I'll be the last one to close the door. I'll just go... God be with you. <laughs> you, you, you had like a <laughs> you had like a sort of feminine laughter from inside, and says. Well, I appreciate the sentiment, and then like the door shuts. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll mutter, uh, not necessarily uh, projecting the voice a lot, but I just mutter, it's like, 
You have no choice. And uh, I close the door. Okay, no problems. And you all... Uh, what was her name again, John? Her name is Serafina Vario. Just give me a second, I will post it in the, the chat on Zoom. That classic love story. It's like, oh, you're so wise. What's your name again? <laughs> <laughs> who, who are you? <laughs> hey, love doesn't need a name. Mm -hmm. It's only a one night thing, remember? Yeah. Although if you um, if you use it continuously on like people, it does get progressively easier to use it on them. Hence the whole like, oh, yeah, you must come back and visit sometime, so I can use presents on you again. And do I know I've been stitched up now afterwards, or is it like you I just have this positive goodwill towards her? You do have this positive goodwill to, towards her. And you won't, when the sort of four hours elapse, you won't instantly be like, oh, I've had some vampire power used on me. But oh, you will yeah. notice as the evening goes on, like the sort of feelings that you had that were like very sort of fiery and very potent at the time, they will slowly start to sort of like ebb away until you, you probably like, oh yeah, she, she just like seemed, well, whatever your thoughts were before, you know, like, oh, she, she was friendly enough, yeah, but like, yeah, yeah. nothing okay. special. So you might infer from that when you, you when you look back, you might be like, oh yeah, I was, I was properly like besotted with her at the time, and now like not so much. So it's pretty reasonable you could probably infer that. And you already knew before she did that there were like these waves of calm sort of washing off her. You yeah, might not know yeah, she's yeah. used an active power on you, but you could easily infer that like oh she had some sort of influence. Okay. Okay, so as we're getting near to the, the end of the session now, is there anything else you guys want to do on the sort of eve of the Hikata gathering? Uh, the only thing I was going to do is look up um, the possibility of getting a secondary haven. Okay. Do you, what sort of thing were you thinking about? Uh, just something basic. So we just need a defensible position basically okay do you have the do you have the resources for that well that's why i'm looking into it i'm not actually going to do it i'm going to so get all quite, the quite prices and spec together got, we've got sort of secondary sort of private havens haven't we yeah i mean i've got one that i don't use at the moment and i think yeah you go i have one for my rifles he's got like his gun locker yeah <laughs> And I've seen it. I really, I've got like it's like Center for the Dark Arts. <laughs> <laughs> it's the uh, the literal corpse locker. Yeah, with with me and the other corpses. So, I think if you were just trying to look to buy like a, a small sort of domicile in one of like the, the rougher, sort of more run down areas of like Venice, that wouldn't be a problem. Mm -hmm. because they're they're not exactly in high demand if it's in one of the the more affluent areas of venice obviously then it becomes progressively more difficult um particularly if you get sort of nearer to the the sort of central heart of venice and the sort of more touristy areas the prices are a lot higher but in a lot oh of no i was gonna it definitely be like the outskirts yeah that's, that's fine you can easily uh if, like say if, you, if you've got like some resources you can easily get a hold of a of a small sort of like one floor like property or something like that like a small like a flat basically and by looking at that effectively you could you could put put you can now put some of your xp if you want into a into that background that advantage to yep. get yourself a lot like some other people have done to get yourself a secondary haven. Okay, so if there's nothing else, I'm gonna suggest we wrap up here on one more Sorry, thing. Just one more thing as the credits start to roll, I guess. All right, Colum um, Colombo. <laughs> uh riddle me this, John. Uh as I uh let oblivion wash over my eyes and turn everything a little bit gray. Um, 
in, I suppose, like the security of my corpse locker, is the sword an object to which any spirits might be tied to no. as a fetter? No. Just checking. Yeah, it's always worth checking. Seems, seems like the kind of implement that would have, you know, people dying horrifyingly <laughs> at the end of it. So just wanted to check if they were uh, like long time bad guys. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Well, I will stash that uh, in the um, uh, in my uh, private haven. Uh, so that is that is bad stuff. Uh, the sword, I mean. Yeah. Not a problem. So, as the the eve of the, I say the evening before the gathering draws to a close, that is where we're going to wrap up the session for this evening. And obviously, most of next session will be the the Hikata gathering and all the sort of stuff associated with that. Obviously, if any of you have any other stuff you want to get up to. We'll try and fit that in as well. If you have any thoughts or stuff you want me to prep for, obviously just like fire a message into the the chat we have going, and we'll work out spending XP and stuff like that, and doing like humanity checks and whatnot in a few moments. But for now, I'm just going to say thank you to my players and to anyone who's watching this either now or in the future, and hopefully we'll see you for the next session in a couple of weeks. Take it easy. <laughs>